live, but mostly recorded, digitized, and distributed for your listening and learning pleasure. It's Mostly Accurate Lectures with Professor Mitchell, the series that answers the questions you might not have cared to ask. Professor Mitchell is an Associate Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Psychologist who specializes in questionable, sarcastic comments and failures to return emails. So sit back, relax, pay attention, and ask yourself, Are you mental illness, the thing actors pretend to have in order to win Oscars. <laughs> now, in real life, mental health can be something of a touchy topic. We don't like to talk about it much. And as one psychiatrist explains, when we do, we don't talk about it well. Stigma still is a very big issue. Uh, it manifests itself in the ways that we think and talk about the, the mentally ill and in the, the terms, the words that we use to describe them. For instance? Wacko. Psycho. Cray cray. Okay. Okay, first, hearing a bearded middle-aged man use the term cray cray may have already killed that word forever. It's like when your mom says something is on fleek. It's done. It's just over at that point. But second, he is right. Cray cray is a terrible name to call someone with mental illness. Although, it is an excellent name for a cartoon crayfish who just won a scuttling contest. <laughs> You did it, Cray Cray! You won the race! <laughs> the point is, we don't, don't, we don't talk about mental illness well. Uh, sometimes, even TV personalities with doctor in their names can get it disastrously wrong. On the next Dr. Oz, everybody wants to know, am I normal or nuts? Should you be worried? This behavior is... <laughs> it's not normal. Have you gone completely insane? I mean, sir, have you gone completely insane? Completely insane people go outside, suck on a rock, and bark at the moon. What the f*** is wrong with you? Sucking on a rock and barking at the moon is not a sign that someone's mentally ill. It's a sign that they are a wolf with an iron deficiency. <laughs> You're thinking of anemic wolves, Dr. Phil. You're getting confused. But perhaps the clearest sign of just how little we want to talk about mental health is that one of the only times it's actively brought up is, as we've seen yet again this week, in the aftermath of a mass shooting as a means of steering the conversation away from gun control. This isn't guns, this is about really mental illness. In many of these shootings we have people who have uh, mental disturbances. Do we need to do a better job in mental health? You bet we do. Yeah, it seems there is nothing like a mass shooting to suddenly spark political interest in mental health. Although it's worth noting that Governor Huckabee's state got a grade of D- minus on mental health care while he was in office. And you can't lecture people on something you got a D- minus in. It's like passionately delivering a speech on proper English grammar by saying, we need to thunk better about how we does word stuff. <laughs> we need to get it did. And the aftermath of a mass shooting might actually be the worst time to talk about mental health. Because, for the record, the vast majority of mentally ill people are non-violent, and the vast majority of gun violence is committed by non-mentally ill people. In fact, mentally ill people are far likelier to be the victims of violence rather than the perpetrators. So the fact we tend to only discuss mental health in a mass shooting context is deeply misleading. It would be like if the only time we talked about Coca-Cola it were in the context of this. I'm standing here with this ice-cold, thirst-quenching, deliciously satisfying Coca-Cola, and it actually tastes better. Now, more than ever, Coke is it. Sure, sure, that happened, and Coke was undeniably involved in it, but most cans of Coke are not that one, and it would be unfair if every time you thought of Coke, you thought of that. <laughs> But if now is our only opportunity to have a public discussion about mental health, then perhaps we should do it. Because in 2013, an estimated 43.8 million American adults dealt with a mental illness. And an estimated 10 million of us suffer from a serious mental illness each year. 10 million! That's almost as many people as live in Greece. 
And most of us know a lot more about Greece than we know about our mental health system. Think about it, you know at least three things about Greece. Its economy is collapsing, Yanni's from there, and Greek yoghurt tastes like the ice cream they'd make in a town where dancing is illegal. <laughs> you know at least three. And when you look at how our current system deals with severe mental illness, you'll quickly realise it's a mess, and it always has been. We used to lock people up in asylums, which were often so bad they were known as snake pits. And that doesn't sound like an attractive place to live, even if you're a snake. You'd want some kind of snake loft or snake bungalow. I don't know. I'm no real snake agent. <laughs> and, and then, and then, and then in the 1960s, President Kennedy signed a bill to try and close as many of those asylums as possible. Under this legislation, custodial mental institutions will be replaced by therapeutic centers. It should be possible within a decade or two to reduce the number of patients in mental institutions by 50% or more. And that was a really good idea, because when you see horrible places doing unspeakable things to people, you are supposed to try and shut them down. That's why there are so few Quiznos left. <laughs> but, but before you get too proud of the fact that we shut those snake pits down, it turns out we never followed through and properly funded the community mental health centres JFK had wanted to replace them. All of those patients had to go somewhere, and some of the places they wound up are shocking. For instance, a few years ago, the AP found that nearly 125,000 young and middle-aged mental health patients were being placed in nursing homes. And it's not a great idea to just stick a young person in with some old people and then hope for the best. It's like casting Taylor Lautner in the new Best Exotic Marigold <laughs> Hotel movie. It's unsuitable for everybody involved in it. And some states have been involved in something called greyhound therapy. And unfortunately, that does not mean getting to hug a trembling dog who's 98% bone and gristle. <laughs> it's an even worse kind of greyhound, the kind with four wheels and a broken toilet. This is Ross and Neal, the only state-run psychiatric hospital in southern Nevada. Ross and Neal has been accused of greyhound therapy, a practice critics call unthinkable discharging seriously ill patients too soon, then supplying them with a one-way bus ticket out of town. I'm sorry, but you cannot just put people you'd rather not see on a bus to another city. If you could, that's how every breakup would end. <laughs> look, look, Greta, it's not you, it's me, but on the other hand, I think you're going to really enjoy your new life in Syracuse. <laughs> And, and we have not even got into the most depressingly common place that people with mental illnesses can end up. Two million people with mental illness go to state and local jails every year. That's meant there's now ten times more people behind bars than in state-funded psychiatric treatment. That is terrible. Finding out jails are our largest provider of mental health treatment is like finding out Lil Wayne lyrics are our greatest source of sexual education. <laughs> Oh, Darren, you can't smack it up, flip it like a spatula. Where did you even learn that? What does it mean, flip it like a spatula? Would you like it if I did that to your mother? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't, Darren. So don't say it. Look, look, using the criminal justice system to treat the mentally ill isn't just ineffective, it's expensive and it's dangerous. Because often when someone is having a mental health emergency, the police will be called. And that can end tragically. By some estimates, an incredible half of all incidents involving the police use of deadly force involve a mentally ill person. And to their credit, some police departments are changing the way they do things, even creating special units like this one. Right. These officers are experts in what's called crisis intervention training. Would you say that you really don't want to die, but you want the pain to stop? Would that be? Yeah, okay. Gonna... And you're willing to get some help today? This woman agrees to get help. We'll go in there together. Uh, you'll ride with us. We're in an unmarked car. It's all part of a pioneering program where the mentally ill are diverted out of jails and into treatment. OK, well, that seems really good, but calling it a pioneering program is a little heartbreaking. Pioneering ideas should not be completely obvious things we should have been doing all along. They should be outlandish things that push the limits of the possible, like a fitted sheet that's easy to fold. <laughs> Or marshmallow airbags. Or a sex doll without such judgy eyes. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Linda. I'm lonely and we both know it. <laughs> Unfortunately, only 15%
of law enforcement agencies even have crisis intervention training programs, let alone special units. And taking that training is typically voluntary. And how can something so essential to your job be voluntary? Take the mascot for the Tampa Bay Rays. We don't let him decide whether or not to wear that costume, because without it, things can get ugly fast. <laughs> it's important for doing his job right. And look, that's just a tiny fix. Our whole system needs a massive overhaul, which won't be easy. The public safety net for the mentally ill spans Medicaid, which is different across the country. Eight federal agencies who administer 112 different programs that in some way touch on mental health. And the social service agencies in each of the 50 states. It is a clusterfuck. Except that's an insult to clusterfucks. Because <laughs> at least in them, there's the potential of a satisfying ending. This is more of a frustrating cluster dry hump of some kind. <laughs> And that's not to say there aren't programs that work. Let, let's look at just one, assertive community treatment. It, it's designed to let those with serious mental illnesses live in the community by providing regular in-home visits and help coordinate, coordinating assistance in things like housing and employment. Listen to just one social worker explain how it can work. What makes mental health might not just be a visit to your psychiatrist, it might also mean having your uh, entitlements in place, or it might mean uh, having your rent pay paid on time. So instead of meeting with a person and talking about how they're doing, how they feel um, on, once a month or twice a month, what we do is everything that it takes to keep people in the community living independently. That's fantastic. Everything it takes sounds like a much better option than what we've apparently been trying, which is nothing, not anything, very few things, not much, and prison. <laughs> and yet, in many states, assertive community treatment programs are in jeopardy thanks to everything from budget cuts to Medicaid reimbursement problems. Despite the fact, a study found that these programs pretty much pay for themselves, which is fantastic. Look, government programs are like graduate students on a first date. If they are able to pay for themselves, it's a f***ing miracle. <laughs> and look, again, that is, that's just one program. There are many more designed for many different levels of need. And we, as a society, we have to figure out how to fund them. Not just because it makes fiscal sense, but because it would save lives. And if I remember rightly, there are some politicians who claim to be pretty motivated to address this problem. This isn't guns. This is about really mental illness. In many of these shootings we have people who have uh, mental disturbances. Do we need to do a better job in mental health? You bet we do. Okay, fine. Do it then. Because if we're going to constantly use mentally ill people to dodge conversations about gun control, then the very least we owe them is a f***ing plan. Welcome to the online lecture for Psychology 205, Abnormal Psychology. Today's lecture will cover psychological assessments, clinical assessment, and initial assessment diagnostic criteria. One of the most long-standing questions in the field of mental health is, how do we determine if someone is mentally ill? We can certainly look at the behaviors, attitudes, and statements of the individuals, but sometimes we don't get the whole story from only half the statement. We'll begin our discussion of psychological and clinical assessment by answering a simple question. What constitutes psychological assessment? On the surface, any type of clinical interview, test, or historical review would constitute a psychological assessment. But there is a significant difference between true psychological testing and assessment and simply gathering information about someone's mental health or mental well-being. 
Psychological practitioners are trained to do careful observation. They're trained to observe for specific traits, specific behaviors, and specific symptoms. They're also trained to not let artificial uh, environmental factors interfere with the observation. The role of the clinician in this case is to integrate a wide range of data and bring into focus diverse areas of knowledge. Once the psychological assessment is performed, a report will be generated by the psychological or mental health practitioner that should be accurate, effective, concise, and highly valued by the recipient. The recipient may be the person who's being tested, who we would call the client or the patient, or the recipient may be the referral source, which may be a company who sends a employee in for uh, employee assistance programs, a school district, a parent, or the court system. Clinical assessment and psychological test need to be two things, valid and reliable. Validity is whether or not a test measures what it is supposed to test. It is very difficult to determine validity because of interference of other factors. The four major types of validity are content, face, criterion, and construct. The least essential type of validity is actually the easiest to, to understand. Face validity is whether or not the test measures what it is supposed to test. For example, if I had a student that I wanted to see how intelligent they were, I could possibly send them out to have them shoot 100 free throws on a basketball court. When they came back, they would report to me that they made 75 free throws, and I would therefore look at a chart and say, if you made 75 out of 100 free throws, I say that your IQ is 110 points, or 100, your IQ is 110. This may be reliable, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's not valid, because the, your ability to make free throws has nothing to do with intelligence. Therefore, we look at tests like the Weschler and the Stanford Brunet that have been validated to show general intelligence. Reliability, on the other hand, is whether or not the test will give us reliable or the same uh, results over and over. There's four different types of reliability, which is test-retest, alternate form, split half, and inner score reliability. We'll talk about three of those. The first, test-retest, is how close will your score be if you test and retest with a sufficient amount of time between the two tests. It stands to reason that if I were to give you an IQ test today and then give you the exact same test tomorrow, you're probably going to do a little bit better simply because you've been primed on some of the questions that I'm going to ask. But if I give you an IQ test today and six months later, something that is a test that is reliable should give me about the same score. The same thing with the alternate form test of a reliability. If I give you the Weschler and the Stanford Binet, I should get about the same intelligence quotient or IQ based upon the results of those two tests if they're both alternate form reliable. Finally, inner score reliability is, is a reliability issue for more subjective tests, such as the Rorschach. Uh, if there is no right or wrong answer, but the assessment is open to some form of interpretation, inner score reliability would be whether or not two clinicians would get about the same results from the same test. If it's not inner score reliable, it simply means that it's a subjective measure that a clinician can use for their own purposes. A final and equally important concept in psychological testing is standardization. Standardization is the uniform procedures used to administer and score a test. This comes in handy on inter-rater reliability. Test norms provide information about where a score on a test ranks in relation to other scores on that test.
How are you sleeping? Um, fine. Most nights. Good. Have you noticed any recurring thoughts or images, things you can't get out of your head? <sighs> How about feelings of guilt or persecution? No, look, Doctor, I don't mean to be rude, but where is this going exactly? We're starting a process, Walt, an ongoing process. Do you prefer Walt or Walter? Ongoing for how long? I just met you, it's hard to say. We could be talking about days, weeks, months. Look, Doctor, I feel fine, really. Now, if this is truly necessary, can't I continue as an outpatient? Walt, a fugue state is a very serious event. What if you were to disassociate while you were driving? What if you were to get into a situation where you could be shot by the police? You understand, we can't allow you to leave until we're certain what happened was a non-recurring event. Saying you feel fine doesn't solve this. Would you tell me about patient confidentiality? It's very straightforward. Without your permission, I can't disclose anything you tell me to anyone. What about my family? Not to your family, not to the police, not to anyone. The only exception would be if you threatened to kill someone. Then I'd be able to tell that person, but only that person. And you, as a medical practitioner, you abide by these strictures absolutely? Yes. All right. There was no fugue state. I remember everything. The truth is, I couldn't stand to spend another second in that house. I just had to get out. And so I left. I didn't think about it, I just did it. I, I walked for a long time, and when I couldn't walk anymore, I hitchhiked. I got as far as Gallup, Then it was just time to come home. So, being found naked in a supermarket, that was your way of giving credibility to a lie? Of avoiding questions about your disappearance? Why run away? What did you feel you had to run from? Doctor, my wife is seven months pregnant with a baby we didn't intend. My 15-year-old son has cerebral palsy. I am an extremely overqualified high school chemistry teacher. When I can work, I make $43,700 per year. I have watched all of my colleagues and friends surpass me in every way imaginable, and within 18 months, I will be dead. And you ask why I ran? Let's spend some time talking about psychological assessment and psychological test by looking at the history of one of the best known psychological tests, the intelligence test. Testing for intelligence has been around for quite some time. In fact, Sir Francis Galton in the mid 1800s looked to test individuals to look at the heritability factor of genius. However, it wasn't until the early 1900s when Simon and Binet were asked by the French government to create an assessment for uh, the education system that we got some true psychological tests. Simon and Binet create, created a test in which students were given uh, the results in the form of mental age, in which their mental age was compared against their chronological age to see if they were above, below, or on task in school. Louis Thurman, in 1916, took Binet's work and created the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, which came up with the first concept of the intelligence quotient, or IQ. The initial way that IQ was calculated was to take mental age 
and divide it by chronological age times 100. So if you had a 10 year old with a chronological age of 10 and a mental age of 10, 10 over 10 times 100 would be 100 and the IQ would be 100, which stands to reason because that would be an average IQ. However, if you had a 10 year old chronological age 10 with a mental age tested at 12, 12 over 10 would be 1.2 times 100 and the intelligence quotient would be 120, which again stands to reason that a 10 year old who has the mental age of a 12 year old would be above average. This was very effective for children, but the big problem with this is that there was no applicability for adults. If you have a 40 year old with the mental age of a 20 year old, 20 over 40 is 0.5 times 100, that would be an IQ of 50, well below average and into intellectual difficulties. However, a mental age of 20 for a 40 year old is relatively average because we know that uh, cognitive ability past the age of about 17 or 18 doesn't advance like it does in childhood. So in 1955, David Weschler developed the new form of intelligence testing that we use primarily today, which is the WACE and WISC, W-A-I-S, Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, and WISC, Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children. In doing so, Weschler developed both uh, subcategories of VIQ and PIQ, Verbal Intelligence Quotient and Performance Intelligence Quotient. This is the most widely used intelligence scale today. The Weschler Intelligence Scales use a standard distribution to rank individuals into categories of intelligence based upon the population every time that the WACE or WISC is re-standardized or re-normalized, 2% of the population will fall into intellectual difficulties, which on this chart is still called by the dsm 4 moniker of mental retardation, and 2-3% to of individuals will fall into the gifted category or IQs above 130. So there are an equal number of people who have an IQ below 70, the threshold for what we used to call mental retardation, the same number of people have an IQ above 130 or the genius level. Now what that means is we can't compare IQs from today to IQs from the 1960s because the, the, the standardization process has changed. And so a 70 IQ in 1960 is not the same as a 70 IQ today. Within that 2-3% to 3 of people who are mentally retarded, 85% fall into what we call mild mental retardation. And again, in DSM-5, this has changed somewhat, but the idea is still the same. 85% of people will have a low-grade mental retardation, meaning that they have an IQ between 70 and 55. Highly functional, but with some cognitive difficulty. 10% will fall into moderate, 6% will fall into severe to profound. So even as we get into the, uh, the smaller categories, we see that as you get further away from average, less and less people have uh, those cognitive difficulties. And this people with mental retardation pie chart that you see here can be switched over into gifted people. 85% of people are gonna fall into that, that realm of IQ of 130 to 150, 155 that are very gifted, but they're not in the super brilliant spectrum. Uh, as you get higher, there are less people who fall in there. And in rehab, they give you what they call the Minnesota Multiphasic Personnel Inventory Test, MMPI test. It caught me by surprise because the last thing you expect after 15 years of active alcoholism is somebody waking you up and going, pop quiz! And you're like, no, no! <laughs> 600 multiple choice questions. But the test is from Minnesota, so the, you know, the choices are, uh, you betcha or gosh darn it. <laughs> gosh darn it. Do you know, I, this is true. In the test, one of the questions in the test is, do you hear voices that tell you what to do? <laughs> and the voices in my, my head were like, no, don't tell them you hear. 
It's like, no. And then I, I get the, the thing back from my counselor in the treatment center, and he says, you checked that you hear voices. I said, well, yes, I hear them, but they're crazy, so I don't listen to them, obviously. <laughs> anyway, what this personality test said about me was that I was an extrovert with extremely low self-esteem. <laughs> Apparently, that's a very rare personality type. There is no treatment, so the doctor says, you better go to Hollywood, at least you might earn a couple of bucks. And that's true, <laughs> to a degree. Outside of intelligence tests, there are hundreds of other different psychological tests that clinical practitioners use to assess not only the mental illness aspect of uh, of clients, but also just to test aptitude, personality traits, and other non-clinical features of an individual. Some of the more popular types of assessments that are used are personality assessments, such as the Rorschach or the MMPI, Minnesota Multifacet Personality Inventory, the 16PF and Myers-Briggs, which are both personality inventories that are used heavily in industrial and organizational psychology, as well as aptitude tests, such as the uh, WRAT, the SAT and ACT tests that many students have taken recently would be considered aptitude tests. And for those of you that are fans of NFL football, you've probably heard of a test called the Wonderlick test that is administered to almost all potential college students entering the NFL draft, specifically quarterbacks. The Wonderlick is a very good aptitude test on figuring out if somebody can be adaptable in their thinking. One of the major complaints about the Wonderlick in the NFL is that it's well known that the Wonderlick is used in the NFL draft, and so it stands to reason that many NFL prospects might get coached on the administration of the Wonderlick. However, we know this isn't universal across the board because every year we hear about a potential draft pick who scores incredibly low on the Wonderlick and thus their ability and aptitude to play at such a high level is questioned. Psychological assessment, just like any other field of science, is prone to errors. And there are two major types of errors that we're going to talk about in this lecture, type one and type two errors. A type 1 error is something that we commonly call a false positive. A false positive or type 1 error occurs when a clinician rejects a true statement or true idea. A type 2 error is often called a false negative. This is when someone fails to reject something that is not true.
Here is an example of type 1 and type 2 errors. Imagine a guy who started dating a young lady. He remembers that on her first date, she mentioned that her birthday was coming up this week, but the gentleman can't remember the exact day. It might be today, or maybe not. Embarrassed to admit that he didn't remember, he decides to make a guess. He has two choices. When he sees her today, he can say, Happy birthday! Or he can say nothing, hoping that today isn't her birthday. The reality behind the situation is pretty simple. Either today is her birthday, or it isn't. So, there are four possible outcomes. Let's look at them. Saying happy birthday when it's not her birthday is like a type 1 error. It's a false positive. I'm saying it's your birthday when, in fact, it isn't. Conversely, staying quiet when today is her birthday is like a type 2 error. It's a false negative. Today is my birthday and you said nothing to me. Hoo hoo, buddy. You missed it. The other two possibilities are good decisions. If it's her birthday and you say happy birthday, good job. If it's not her birthday and you say nothing, again, good job. Just don't forget to do it when her birthday actually comes around. From the faculty, administration, support staff, student body, and the rest of Indiana, good luck on your quiz and enjoy learning about the rest of the wonderful art and science of psychology.